So today is a special day. Do y'all know what day it is? Shh, think about it, think about it. Because if we'd have woke up with this kind of special day in May, I think you probably might have possibly could have remembered it. I don't know if it was June, you might hit on it. I always mess up whether it's second Sunday or third Sunday, but it seems like even, even that old fellow right there sort of stays in front of everything and, you know, is uh, at least recognized just a little bit. So, anybody wake up this morning thinking about the fact of what today is? By, by the way, anybody know what today is? Anybody know what today is? September 13th. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alright, Beverly, I'll let you tell them since they don't want to. It's Grandparents Day. Today is Grandparents Day. It's Grandparents Day. Now, see, I don't know how many of y'all would skip past Mother's Day in May, would you? Could you? Could you, would you? Would you, could you? No. How many of you would skip right on past Father's Day? Well, some of us do, but not even Father's Day. But boy, when it comes to Grandparents Day. So this morning I decided, well, let me first say that I have entered my absolute prime granddaddying years. In fact, I'll even tell her once in a while, I'll even tell my youth group. You, you, can, you can ask. I'll ever even tell them every once in a while, I'll go, you know, I, I love y'all, I'd like to meet with you. But my grandkids are here this weekend, and you know, I don't know how many MYL youth groups I've been to, probably a couple of 10, 25,000, 30,000, I don't know. But I don't know how many times my grandkids will actually want to come over to my house. What do y'all think? I mean, I got this surprising little thing that I don't know, maybe, maybe it won't happen that way, but I, I got this idea that by the time they get 15 or 16 years old, uh, going over to Mama and Granddad's house no. might be important. Okay. Beverly's got to say There's something there. There's three of them that will always have I think, though, we've got a couple of them grandbabies. <laughs> Hook pretty good, though. Y'all yeah. know what I mean. Some of you grandmas are like that. So, uh... What do y'all know about the book of Ruth? Book of Ruth is a little old bitty pamphlet <laughs> stuck right in between some big old books. If you'll open your Bible and you'll go to 1 Samuel, of course 1 Samuel, I believe, how many chapters is 1 Samuel? 31. Y'all know what comes after 1 Samuel? Six Samuel. Man, it's a big old book right there. And then you back up right before Ruth and you know what you got? Judges. Don't that sound like And it's stuck right in between Judges and Samuel. You all see that? In my Bible, it takes up three whole pages front and back. Y'all know about Ruth? Do y'all know why Ruth is stuck right there between Judges and Samuel? Four chapters long? You might have just skipped right past it. Well, let me tell you about Scripture. This is true about most stories. If you want to get in on what's going on, you look at the beginning. Now, the middle and everything, it fills it out and everything. But if you want to get to the conclusion and what the, what's going on here... Generally, if you go to the last chapter, the last things being said, it'll clue you in on what's been going on the whole thing. So do y'all know about Ruth? Y'all know about gleaning? Do y'all know what gleaning is? Do, do y'all know how to fall in love on a thrashing, sweet thrashing floor? I just wonder, have y'all ever had a romance while you was gleaning and thrashing wheat? Do y'all know about Ruth? Well, let's go right to the end. Look at this. I'm going to start in the 13th verse. That's how close we are to the end. That's all commentary. In fact, let's read all the way to the end. Here we go. Y'all ready? Ruth chapter 4. Last chapter. Last words. Here we go. So, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. 
That's fast, wasn't it? Then the women said to Ruth, whoa, whoa. Then the one women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, what's her name, uh, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, oh my goodness, has born you. Then Naomi, y'all got this movie played out in your brains? Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. Yeah, yeah, that's what it says. A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminadab, Aminadab of Nashon, Nashon of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, Obed of Jesse, and Jesse of David. The end. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Among the many things that make us human beings unique to creation, in fact, this is sort of true of a couple of species in that you have to live to a ripe old age. One of the first ones I can think about that this is a little bit true of, but not quite true the way it is for us, believe it or not, is elephants. Elephants. Among the many things that make human beings unique in creation, except for a few species who live for a ripe old age, is the presence of and influence of grandparents. The impact of grandma and grandpa, of granny and grand grand, of nana and pop, of mamma and granddaddy, of mimi and papa, of big mama and big daddy. In fact, I knew a lady whose grandson called her Gogo. By whatever name they go by, the impact of grandparents in history is beyond calculation. And I talk about world history, I'm talking about biblical history, I'm talking about everything. Now, y'all ready for a really nice statement? Are you ready? Most of the famous people of the Bible from Adam and Eve on were grandparents. Duh. <laughs> now what I mean is grandparents that played a key role. If not the majority role. Hezekiah. That's a name I like. Hezekiah was one of the best kings God's people ever had. You can look him up. But his father was Ahab. And he was a stinker. He was one of the worst kings they ever had. But his grandfather was, anybody know? Joseph. And Joseph did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Hezekiah took after his grandfather rather than his father, and the result was righteousness before the Lord. So that, because of the powerful influence of grandparents, there's always hope. There's always hope. Even if one generation goes astray, even if one generation just turns rotten, because the next generation can be brought back, and in that lies the glory, 
the importance, the significance of grandparents. They often bridge the gap between parents and children. And like I said, they make major difference in the course of history. The relationship of grandparents and grandchildren is so unique because it's full of hope. It's full of expectation. This, by the way, by the way, explains the mystery of how a boy who is not good enough for your daughter can father such marvelous children. Or it explains why that girl unworthy of your son can bear such brilliant beings as your grandkids. Right. So here's your strange question. But the book of Ruth makes us ask it. Y'all know Ruth? Is a baby on the day of its birth more of a child or a grandchild? Who's been waiting a little longest? But that, maybe that's not me. Is a child on the day that is born more of a child or a grandchild? In other words, who is to be more congratulated? The parents or the grandparents? Well, if you paid attention up here this morning, for some reason, the book of Ruth votes for grandparents. And it makes this passage one of the most powerful exaltations of grandmother you will find anywhere in human history, in human literature. Y'all know Ruth? Y'all know Ruth? It's almost as if the goal of this little pamphlet stuck in here, this little book of Ruth, was to come to a happy ending with Grandma Naomi holding Grandson Obed in her lap and everybody singing her praise. Do y'all know Ruth? I mean, note how suddenly the story of Ruth and Boaz comes to an end. You know, their, their, their romance, their gleaning. Y'all ever glean? They're, they're thrashing wheat. I mean, that must have been some special thrashing. Their romance had been dominated throughout the whole first three chapters. Well, they had to meet in the first one. But notice, notice that their wedding, a conception, nine, barely says ten, ten months of waiting on the baby's arrival, their whole life together is wrapped up in one short verse. One, verse 13. Y'all ready for some light speech? Here we go. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. We went from wife to baby in one verse. Now I know some of you do it like that. But. And the beginning of the next after that, then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord. <laughs> when Ruth gave birth to that baby boy, she and Moab left the stage. The spotlight focuses on Grandma, y'all, for the whole closing scene. There's not another word about parents. No, the star is now Grandma. Look at her holding that baby. Isn't that precious? All of the praise, all of the rejoicing now revolves around her. Naomi has a kinsman redeemer, right? Naomi has a comfort for her old age. Naomi has a grandson. No, no, no. Scripture puts it this way. A son has been born to Naomi. Like I said earlier, she said the goal of this whole book was to come to a happy ending with Grandma Naomi holding Grandson Obed in her lap. This radical removal of the parents, 
This thrusting of grandma and grandchild, front and center, is a powerful revelation of just how important a role grandparents play in the life of the child. Or should we say, can play, should play. The genealogy that ends this book is a list of people, all who became important, influential grandparents. Obed, the baby of Ruth, was whose granddaddy? King David. So this scene ends with King David's grandfather being robbed by his grandmother. That sounds like a whole bunch of grand, grand, grandmother, grandfather stuff to me. What about you? The book of Ruth ends with a special emphasis on grandparents and with such deliberate focus on Naomi that I don't know anywhere in the Bible that you might find a better scripture for. What's today? Grandparents' day. God has so made human life that grandparents play a major role of what happens in history. And it's because of their special love. It is because of the special influence on children, on grandchildren. So great is this influence that even parents who fail their children can become successful grandparents that the family tree can be healed, y'all. In other words, just because you was a bad mom and daddy don't mean you've got to be a bad grandma and grandpa. You can get over that stuff and restore folks who bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And y'all know this, we talked about this a little bit last week. To bear fruit, you've got to have good roots, right? The book of Ruth, this tiny little sliver in here, the book of Ruth exists to trace the roots of King David of Israel. And there's no way to do this apart from getting into the lives of grandparents. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how important roots are. Margaret Mead, a noted anthropologist, has stated, and I think you'll agree with this statement, listen, somehow we have to get the older people, grandparents, widows and widowers, spinsters and bachelors, back close to children. If we are to restore a sense of community, a knowledge of the past, and a sense of future to today's children. Rootless people are the results, y'all. At least in part of being ripped away from the influence of grandparents. I mean, grandparents can be just that. Parents who are grand. Now, it doesn't happen this way all the time. But this is what I've come to understand. This is, this is a little bit about, I think, how, how it works best. This is, this is a little bit of how I think it's supposed to be. This is how it's supposed to be. They don't have to be the disciplinarians of life. Don't answer this question. Did your mama ever spank you? This is not the way it is across the board. This maybe is more like it could, should be. <clears throat> they don't have to be the disciplinarians of life and so they're more free to be the teachers of values they have opportunities to talk and share in ways that parents don't have or I don't know don't 
take advantage of because they don't see from the same perspective as do grandparents. Grandparents are often the key to a child's self-esteem. Don't sell yourself short. You can be the key to the encouragement of your grandchild, but nobody else is. Especially mom and dad. Grandparents provide the opportunity for grandchildren to develop roots. Establish an identity that's not limited to the present. Tell me just right here, right now. You don't know how many funerals I've stood at and people stand up and go, you don't, I wish, you just don't know how important my grandparents were. Y'all, I talk about my granddad like he's down the road. You can ask Beverly. I quote him all the time. Y'all heard me. He's been dead for over 25 years. He was my philosopher. They help us develop roots. Roots that reveal a larger picture that will go beyond you. Also, it's important to note that the grandchild-grandparent relationship is a two-way street. <clears throat> this is the way it should be. The child has as great an impact on the adult as the adult does on the child. Y'all, we're talking about renewal. In verse 15, the women say of baby old bed, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Y'all, this little guy for Naomi was better than Social Security or Jericho. It brought about change. Now, of course, us parents already know that our parents have ceased to exist. These people who are now the grandparents of our children in no way resemble the people we used to call mama and dad. My dad, my father would show up passing out money to everybody. I'd ask him for a dollar and he'd tell me his life story. <laughs> Grandparents have changed from when they were parents. Hmm, emotional. They now value relationship with a child higher than all that other stuff. You better mind me, boy. As long as your feet are my table. They risk for the sake of relationship. Mm, we already know love. Love it. For example, and this is just one little thing, but there's about a million things that are like this, but let me give you one example. My parents would never, and this is my daddy, I hope y'all remember Ron Wiggins. My daddy would not let me drink coffee. <laughs> I won't <laughs> But my memo would always let me have coffee. Of course, it was one part coffee and a thousand parts milk. 
but I always felt like, felt like it was such a big deal, big deal to have my own cup, own cup, sit around the table with the big people. <laughs> know what I mean? The reason grandparents tend to spoil grandchildren is because of this renewal in the minds of the grandparents. I mean, they're so grateful for the new joy, the pleasure of life, that they say thanks by being overindulgent. And boy, is my Beverly good at being overindulgent. <laughs> This makes the grandparent-grandchild relationship one which is dominated by the positive. It's a relationship of fun. Fun. The fun is mutual. This is the way it should be. For most grandparents get more laughs from their grandchildren than they do anybody else. Tell me your stories. <laughs> right? One little boy said, I'm sorry, Grandma. I, 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 I scratched my arm on your cat. You need to tell it. Another little girl who was taken to the movie theater for the first time in her life by her grandfather. Took over grandfather by whispering, Grandpa, what channel is this? <laughs> Here's your good quote. Children, children are always a handicap to grown-ups who want to lead a dull life. Amen, Mary Jane? Children are always a handicap to grown-ups who want to lead a dull life. I'd like to share with you in closing this morning what I call a little girl's description of a grandmother. Y'all ready for this? A, a grandmother is a lady who don't have no children of her own. So she likes other people's little children. A grandfather is a man grandmother. <laughs> he goes for walks with the boys and they talk about fishing and tractors and snakes and things like that. Grandmas don't have to do anything except just be there. They're old so they shouldn't play hard or run. Should. It's enough that they drive us to the store and get soda pop. They have lots of dimes and quarters for the buckle machine. Or if they take us for walks, they should slow down past things like pretty leaves and, and caterpillars. And they should never, ever, never, ever, never say, Hurry up. Usually they are fat, but not too fat to tie kids' shoes. They wear glasses and funny underwear. <laughs> they can take their teeth out and their gloves on. And it's better if they don't type right or get on the computer, except with us. They don't have to be smart. You know, only answer questions like, uh, why dogs hate cats and how come God isn't married? When they read to us, they don't skip. Or mind if it's the same story Everybody should try to have one. Especially if you don't have television. Because grandmas and grandpas are the only grown-ups who've got
parents who are great. Grandparents have such a powerful impact on the lives of grandchildren. They change the course of history. They give us a sense of our roots. And no matter how rotten a generation becomes, there's always hope for renewal because the next generation can be turned toward righteousness. 